All right, so I'm going to be talking about the National Bike Summit, and the dates for it are very soon. It starts this coming Sunday, and it goes through Wednesday, March 3rd. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the league first, and then the summit specifically, and then lobby day, which is the last and final day of the summit, and then how to get involved if this sounds interesting to you. So a little bit about me first. Um, like Sarah said, I'm the league's policy intern. And I have been since November, 2020. Um, I grew up in Austin, Texas, and I moved to the Bay Area for to go to school at Stanford University. And yeah, I studied a whole mix of things, um, environment, design, engineering, communications. Um, and then I stuck around for a little bit to work in sustainability projects. So a lot of food system stuff, waste, energy, kind of a mix of things, but ultimately I found myself studying transportation, um, which really hooked me. I just love taking transit, biking, uh, walking, all of that. So I came back to Austin last year and I found myself at the league um, helping out with all the federal policy efforts. So it will actually be my first time attending the summit myself and my first time lobbying for anything. So um, I hope that can maybe be a little bit of a comfort for any of you who are new to this. Uh, trepidatious in any way. So a little bit about the League first. Um, we were founded in 1880 as the League of American Wheelmen. And these are just a, a couple fun images from back then. If you can't read the, the little bib on the horse, it says, I want good roads. So we've been lobbying for better biking and better roads for a long time. Um, we're a nonprofit and a national membership based organization. So we have about 18,000 individual members and another 2,000 clubs, businesses, and advocacy organizations. Um, and we have a whole range of programming. So we do education efforts, which we call smart cycling, and we um, train certified instructors all across the country to teach other people, everyone in their communities, better biking habits and practices. Um, and then we also do a lot of advocacy work, which is the department that I'm in. Um, so the summit is a huge part of that, but we also do efforts throughout the year. And that includes helping individual states and, and local communities with putting out action alerts. So I just put out an action alert for a bill that went through Oklahoma um, last week. So things like that. Um, and then we do a lot of benchmarking, giving educational webinars, collecting data. So we're a good source for information. Um, and then we have this uh, section called Bicycle Friendly America. So our big kind of vision is, is we think life is better for everyone when more people ride bikes. And one of those programs that is uh, Bicycle Friendly America. So I broke it down into how it looks for Idaho. And y'all have um, 33, you're ranked 33. And you have five communities that I've listed um, there on the left. 45 bike friendly businesses and one bike friendly university. So this is just a little snapshot. And there's a link in that top corner if you wanna go click around more, see what those businesses are, learn more about that. So on to the summit. Uh, like I said, it starts this Sunday and it goes through Wednesday. And the theme this year is bikes, our vehicle for change. Um, and it's all about that, but we have tons of great sessions and um, I'll list those here. So it's all virtual. Usually it would be in person in Washington, DC. Um, but since it's virtual, we, we're hoping, we will, we've already seen that a lot more people have registered. We've gotten 900 plus registrants and uh, over 500 people registered to lobby. So a really awesome showing this year and it would be a great year for you to join if it's your first time and just see what it's all about. Um, so like I said, it goes Sunday through Wednesday. And the sessions begin at noon every day, except for on lobby day, the meetings are set throughout the whole day at different times based on people's time zone. But the programming sessions themselves begin at noon and run through the evening, including things like happy hours and the, all the fun events. Um, and on Wednesday, if you just wanna do session things, there are alternative sessions offered. Um, so you don't have to participate in lobby day. Uh, but on the flip side of that, if you're only interested in lobby day, we have created a special code for people to register um, that's a much reduced price. It's only $25 and I'll share the pricing details at the end of this. Um, and that's for folks who only wanna lobby, don't wanna attend sessions. So you can just try that out if you want to and I'll share that code at the end. 
So just a little sample of the programming. Um, Sunday starts kind of light with some light sessions. There's a, a little virtual bike ride that you can watch by this couple. Um, that's the photo of them in the right. They live in the Netherlands. They're called the Bruntlets. Um, and so they, they have this whole program where they film different rides. And then there will be different group specific programs. So like all the programs that I mentioned that the league does, clubs, advocacy, um, education, we have all different programs for those folks. Um, then we're gonna give a little refresher of the asks for anyone who has questions there. And then a member meeting. Um, Monday, I won't read all of these. Uh, I put the link in the top corner if you wanna go explore the agenda more in depth yourself and see who the speakers are. Um, but the opening plenary is, should be great. We have the transportation committee chairman, Peter DeFazio, and also representative Ayanna Presley speaking. So that should be really exciting. And then there'll be two blocks of panels. Each session is about 45 minutes um, with all kinds of uh, events from safety to empowering women to health programming with the CDC um, to federal highway administration programs. Uh, and then we'll closing plenary. Tuesday, kind of the same, the similar format. Um, we have an opening plenary. This one is about uh, exploring the impacts of over-policing BIPOC communities. So that's um, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, uh, if you're unfamiliar with that acronym. And this is with speaker Charles Brown. So he'll be going over what mobility and policing and enforcement looks like in the US and how this connects with all of this work. So that should be a really good, a really good plenary. And then two more blocks of panels um, and then a little bike film festival at the end. So some fun screenings at the end of the day there. So that brings us to lobby day, which I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about. Um, so this is gonna be March 3rd. It's the final day of the summit um, and it's Wednesday. And like I said, it's my first time doing it, but I've been in conversations with all the different state coordinators and I'm pretty excited to participate and hope that I can encourage all of you too as well. So usually again, these would be in person um, and folks get to actually meet with their senators or representatives or their staff um, in at, at the Hill um, in DC, running around all day from meeting to meeting. And it's a pretty, from what I hear, it's a pretty exciting energy. Um, so, a little bit of background on why this is important um, if you haven't done much lobbying of any kind before. So the bicycling movement has really been pretty successful over the years uh, in advocating for a lot of change at all levels of government, getting funding for all kinds of projects. And that's not because we have a ton of money to throw around, but it's because of our people power, really. Um, it's because bicyclists show up and they engage with legislators. and. For the league, uh, this is a huge component of what we do. And the summit, the National Bike Summit is how we start this process every year. Um, so like I said, we continue to work on different legislative efforts throughout the year, but this is really the big beginning. Um, and in-person meetings with constituents are especially important. Um, data has shown, and just from our experience, we know that uh, in-person constituent meetings are the most effective lever to changing a, Congress, a member of Congress on an issue and affecting how they think about it. So this doesn't apply to y'all, but there are a ton of new members this year in particular. Um, so for a lot, of, a lot of these states that are gonna be lobbying this year, they'll be talking to members who have never thought about biking. And so it's really important that we bring our voice in and share our experiences and tell our stories because otherwise they just wouldn't know that we're out here. Um, so our big goal for these meetings is to really build relationships with staff and with their uh, and with elected officials. Um, this is a process that happens throughout the year, year after year. Uh, so these meetings are really about starting relationships if we haven't met them already and also continuing to build them. So we want to encourage people to also be in contact with, with their officials after and outside and in between meetings. And we have resources and um, guidelines on how to do that. Uh, but this meeting is really the big start of it. 
And our goal for the staff and their officials is, is for them to come away from the meeting, understanding the role of bicycling, especially in their community. So tell them about specific projects, tell them about actual impacts, um, tell them how many members are in the local organizations, um, give them a really clear understanding of what biking means for their constituents. And then also make sure that they know who the community of advocates is and who they can contact with questions. And then of course, know what the actual ask is. So for every meeting, we have a very specific ask that we're asking of the folks that we're meeting with. And I'm gonna go into detail about all of those, but um, that's kind of the pinnacle of the meeting. Most of the time it's co-sponsoring a bill and this year that's what it will be. So this year in particular is really important. Um, if there's this thing called the surface transportation reauthorization that which is the big transportation bill and this is up for renewal every five years and it is right now. Um, it failed to pass both the House and Senate last year and so it's up again this year. So this will impact have a really big impact and it's really important that we can get everything incorporated in it um, that we can for, for biking, for pedestrians, for transit. Um, and then an e a, another huge impact this year is the MUTCD, which stands for Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Uh, and this is the guidebook of how to plan and engineer roads, what signals should look like, how, how to plan, you know, what actually, what components are, make up a road, um, what users are being planned for, are there, what should sidewalks look like and crosswalks and all of the details like that, that are used by planners and engineers. And this is only reviewed every 10 years. So it's in the public comment process right now and it will be through, I don't remember the exact date, sometime in April or May, it was extended recently. So that's a really big deal. Um, and like I mentioned, there are a ton of newly elected officials this year. So we really wanna make sure we meet with them. Um, and there are really big hopes for a large and bipartisan infrastructure package. If I was researching through the campaigns of, of everyone who ran last fall, um, just to kind of get background on them. And a lot of them included infrastructure in, in their campaign promises. Um, so everyone's talking about it. Biden uh, specifically has talked about infrastructure as um, a second COVID bill. So it's a really big priority for him. Um, and if you haven't heard about who is new at the Department of Transportation, um, there are some good folks there who can make positive change like Secretary Pete Buttigieg, um, who has done a lot for, um, for his community in terms of getting complete streets, getting safety, getting a lot of funding for good projects um, back in South Bend. So um, there are good folks in place and a lot of potential and um, just a lot of highlight on, the, on these issues this year. So it's a really great year to step in. And since there are more folks involved, since it's virtual, um, you, and since you have a great pair of, of state coordinators leading you, you don't necessarily have to be worried about uh, you know, being pressured to be an expert in all of this because you have a great team and you can just kind of take a, a backseat and, and uh, just see what it's all about. So even if you're worried about anything, I, I would say it's an awesome year to try it out. So these are y'all's elected officials. I just pulled these um, and meetings have been requested with all four of them, the two senators and the two representatives. Um, the senator meetings have been confirmed and the rep meetings are still pending, um, but you could meet with all four potentially um, and get to know them even more deeply if you don't know much about them yet. And this is the district map if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, so we have Fulcher on, in the first, um, and then there's the second on the right. Now, if you've never been in a lobby meeting, um, which like I said, I have not before, <laughs> but this is kind of how a typical meeting will go. So they're all scheduled for about 30 minutes. And a lot of times the, the Senator or representative or their staff won't have time for the whole thing. So it might even be shorter. We always ask at the beginning of each meeting how much time you have, 
or if, if 30 minutes still works or if they need to take off early. So they're pretty quick um, and um, pretty dense with information because we have our stories we wanna tell them and we have the asks that we wanna make. So in general, you know, we get online early, online of course, because it's, it's all through Zoom this year. Um, and then everyone will give welcome and introductions kind of tell their brief background of where, where they are, where they're from and, and why they care about biking. And then we always wanna appreciate whoever we're meeting with for something they've done. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about biking or transportation, um, but you know, members of Congress have, spend a lot of time hearing from people who have complaints about things. And so it's always really good to start off with thanking them for something. Because like I said, these meetings really are about um, building relationships. And so we want them to be as um, congenial as possible and really make sure they aren't on the defensive and, and we can have a productive conversation and, and truly understand what they think about the issues and what they need to know. Um, then of course we talk about bike, bicycling specifically um, and then make the ask itself. Um, so we'll have fact sheets and everything that we're, that the league is still working on, but if you're interested in learning more about the asks, uh, which I'm gonna give a quick preview of in a second, but if you're interested in learning more, we have tons of resources for that. Um, and then there's a period for discussion where the, everyone can ask each other questions and, and talk about everything in more depth. And then a quick wrap up and debrief. And of course, follow it up with uh, sending a thank you note and staying in touch. So what are the asks this year? There are three main ones. There, um, there are two bills in the Senate and two in the House. Transportation alternatives, this first one I'm gonna talk about is in both the Senate and the House. Um, so transportation alternatives was, it was this program created in 2012 and it was kind of built on two tenants. Um, the idea of giving more local control and because very little of federal transportation dollars goes to local projects. So this program was created to do that and also um, to create competition because it's, uh, so there, there's a required grant process and application process. And this gives set asides for communities of all different sizes. So there's a specific amount of funding for small communities under 200,000, uh, or I forget the number exactly, but smaller communities, medium, and then uh, larger communities. So there's like competing with like and better chance for communities to get what they need. But this program has been extremely oversubscribed. There are a lot of projects that aren't getting funded. Um, and this, this chart that I've put on the right gives some numbers from a couple years ago. Um, and it's similar now. It's the number of projects that have left, been left unfunded is up to over 6.7 billion. So that's a lot of really big projects all across the country that are just waiting for money and communities want to implement them. Um, but this, the way the program is set up currently, there isn't enough funding. It's, um, and also it's the way it's structured in the application process and, and project implementation, it's just inefficient. Um, so a couple of the changes that this uh, Transportation Alternatives Enhancement Act would, uh, the way it would improve the TA program um, so one, it would ensure a fair increase of funds because it's been set to just a, a flat capped amount and it would switch to being a percentage of overall transportation fundings. So it would increase as the rest of the transportation budget does and make sure that there are more funds available. It would also improve the project application process, which is a huge part of it. So right now, a lot of small communities just don't have the engineering capacity to, to create strong applications. And so this bill would require states to help them out with applications and make sure they have resources to put forth as strong of an application as possible to get the best chance of getting funded. And it would, so in order to do that, it would partially give states more flexibility um, in, in how they use dollars because, um, and also increase local control. So one thing about transportation projects is States are allowed to transfer up to 50% of funding for a transportation program to any other transportation program. And this definitely applies to transportation alternatives. So a lot of the times states will get TA funding and then just immediately transfer 
all 50% of it to bigger state projects that they that are higher priority to them. And so these local communities don't even have a chance to apply for it. So this bill would ensure that that states are that states are required to give local communities the chance to apply and help them with applications first. So that would be huge in just creating access to this funding. And then another addition that we're adding is uh, prioritizing high need areas. So um, this would, so a lot of the applications are based around like a point system and a lot of states already do this, about 21, um, 21 states currently prioritize high need areas in, in applications. So this would include areas like, um, you know, folks that are low income, transit dependent, um, seniors, people with disabilities, areas where there are a lot of children, uh, rural areas oftentimes. So even though, so a lot of this transportation, and I, I mentioned the rural thing because a lot of this transportation work can really be fun um, to be bipartisan and a lot of it can, you know, like I said, this is about local control and um, increasing and, and giving a lot of local communities small amounts of funds. So it's not a huge dollar ask and it's, and it's about local control. So you can make a lot of arguments for, for Republicans to support this and it doesn't have to be a strongly partisan um, debate that you're having. So this is an overview of transportation alternatives. Um, Next one is Complete Streets. So this one is just in the Senate. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Complete Streets, it's, um, really it's basically, what was that? Do you have a question? Sorry. Sorry, I accidentally unmuted. Oh, no worries. Okay, but yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so Complete Streets is basically about planning roads and streets to uh, be friendly for all users that are on them. Um, bikers, walkers, transit riders, uh, people using mobility devices, really planning for all humans that are gonna be on them. And there are a number of different guidelines, um, but this, but there is no unified federal guideline on this. So over 1600 policies have already been adopted across the US. And that includes by 35 different states. So a lot of a lot of communities and states are trying have already passed legislation that this is important to them, and and passed programs and uh, design guidelines, and it, they're they're all different kinds of formats. Um, and so it's important to a lot of folks, but um, there have also been some uh, grievances, and you know these policies are just sitting there; they aren't really being implemented, or um, they aren't strong enough, and so. This bill would create minimum standards of what a policy includes. So this might including this might include re reform of current policies that aren't up to par. Um, and of course, you know, policies will be totally different depending on what communities are, urban versus rural, or all kinds of different breakdowns or breakdowns. They'll still be quite diverse. Um, and then it would create a state level grant program to help fund creation of these plans and also building projects. Um, and so these grant programs would especially help with retrofitting existing streets and roads because most of the complete streets the policy work applies to uh, create designing better new roads and it would apply to any, any new projects. Um, but we also wanna make sure that the existing roads are adapted to, to serve everyone better. And so this grant program would help do that. Um, and then it would also require states and MPOs, which stands for Metropolitan Planning Organizations, to adopt and implement design standards. Um, so how they actually adopt these policies into their, their planning and design regulations, which is really important. Um, and this bill would also prioritize high need areas, um, similar to the transportation alternatives. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of complete streets. And then safe streets is the final one. So this one's just in the house. Um, it has already been um, introduced. It's HR 508, if you're interested in looking it up. And safety is a really crazy problem. It's just been totally overlooked. So if you looked at, at these pie charts on the right, um, 
Bicyclists and pedestrians make up only 12% of trips. That's the top pie chart. Um, and yet they make up 20% of fatalities. And this number is increasing and also increasing disproportionately to the total number of fatalities because overall fatalities across the country are decreasing. Um, but for bikes, bicyclists and pedestrians, this number is still going up. And, and yet, despite that, um, the Highway Safety Improvement Program funding, H HSIP, HSIP, uh, gives less than 1% of funding to bike and pedestrian safety programs. Uh, so this disparity is just shocking and this bill aims to remedy it. Um, so it's kind of framed around this idea of uh, a VRU, vulnerable road user. And VRUs encompass bicyclists, pedestrians, and people using mobility devices. So, I mean, you can imagine what, who, who that is. Um, so HR 508 would rank states um, by, by their VRU fatalities and serious injuries. So first it would create just kind of a benchmarking overview. So we, so we have a better scope of what the problem looks like from state to state. And then for states that fall above the median, it would require them to perform a specific VRU assessment. Um, so really go into detail about where those hotspots are and what areas they need to address and you know, who is being affected. Um, and then it would require investment in bike and pedestrian safety and, um, and identification of which areas are high risk uh, for VRUs. And it would also require um, reporting funding. So right now the way the funding is spent is kind of opaque and it's not totally required um, and so you know, states can say they're doing one thing, but we don't really know how much money is going to safety. So this bill would require them to report specifically on, on how they have spent and how they're planning to spend um, their safety funding for, for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so one, one interesting thing about how kind of hotspots and, and, and important areas are uh, determined right now and how this would change that is um, currently, states look for, they call them hotspots. And the thing is our cars have been getting a lot better over the past few years. So, so if you look at, if you're only looking at hotspots where, where folks are, are in vehicles are dying, then you're gonna see really you know, significant interstates and also intersections where they're very specific, like head on collisions, like specific turns and things like that. So the areas where fatalities show up aren't necessarily the same places that we would want to implement safety measures for vulnerable road users. Um, because bike and bicyclists and pedestrians usually um, are hurt along corridors, so not necessarily specifically in one spot, but along a whole strip that is, has high speeds and not a lot of infrastructure and has destinations that people are trying to get to on both sides. So it's not necessarily one specific spot, but along corridors. And so the whole framework for how we decide where to implement safety measures um, kind of needs some, some remedying and this bill would help do that. Um, so that's a little bit about safety. And like I said, if you wanna go, if you wanna learn more about all of these, we have a great um, webinar that goes into more detail and we're gonna be putting fact sheets out soon. Um, so the link to that webinar should be in, uh, in the chat. So if this sounds interesting to you um, and you want to get involved, you can register for the summit um, very soon because it begins Sunday, although registration will be open through all the way through the summit. So if you decide on Monday or Tuesday that you want to join lobby day, that's all right. Um, but do it as soon as possible if you can. So the pricing is $180 just for anybody general. Um, if you're a league member, and membership costs forty dollars, then it's only sixty. So if you join and um, then register, that's a hundred total. And for youth, if you know any young people who want to get involved, it's totally free, and that's for folks who are twenty-one and under. Um, so we're also giving live presentations of the Asks webinar and another webinar we put together that's lobbying one at one, kind of an introduction to in more detail what it looks like to, to lobby and why it's important. So that will be, Lobbying 101 will be tonight um, and an Asks webinar will be tomorrow. And these are gonna be basically the same as the pre-recorded ones, but 
if you want to hop on live, if you have any specific questions you want to ask, that would be a great time to do that. Um, and then become a, a member of the league. And if you, even if you don't want to join the summit, um, but you are interested in maybe being involved in future events, consider becoming a member and subscribe to our mailing list to keep in the loop. Um, and that link that I put has kind of all the basic summit information and, and where to go to register and all of that and the agenda that you can scroll through in more detail. Um, and then that's my contact in the bottom. So that's kind of a quick overview of what lobby day looks like and um, yeah, I'll go ahead and stop there and open it up for questions or for Lisa Brady to talk about her their the experience in Idaho specifically. Does anybody have a question for Cecily while we've got her before we go and listen to Lisa talk about the Big Hill Day? I'll just say this um, because I've worked with the TAP program for many years. I'm so glad that we're focusing on this and I hear rumors that, that they're trying to double it. I don't know where we are on that, but in Idaho, for those of you who don't know this, um, we get just under $4 million a year for TAP and we get um, about $12 million a year uh, worth of requests. So for all of you who apply for TAP projects, you know how incredibly hard it is to get funded and ITD does obligate all of the money. So we look really good compared to other states on when you show those comparison charts, you know, and these states don't spend, these states do, and Idaho looks pretty good. But what our DOT does on the back end is they have a policy that if you don't obligate all of that money in the year that, that, that it is meant for, they take that money and they broom it out. So it goes to roads and bridges. And so, and it's their policy, it's not federal policy. Federal policy allows you to use federal dollars for three years plus one, so four years basically, but they take that money out. Now it's a small amount of money that gets swept out every year. It's like $200,000, it's not a ton of money. But I know that could fund a lot of sidewalks in this state. And I know people on this call who would love to have that money to build their projects. So I don't know if the, if the bill will address anything like that, Cecily. It would be great if it would really have language in there that would not allow DOTs to touch that money at all. It's so precious and keep it where it is. Yeah, I'm waiting for the um, the language of the specific bill to come out. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we're trying to have as many protections as possible. Thanks. Yeah, Jim, did you have a question? I did. Can I ask a question, Cynthia? Please do. Yeah. One day we're going to drop the word alternative to what we did do as soon as we're, uh, you know, one years old and start walking. Um, we've been doing that longer than we've been getting behind the wheel. So it, we would be nice to see something we advocate for to talk about, um, refer to it as transportation, sort of normal transportation, normal moves. The question I have, and having observed this sort of builds on what Cynthia is saying, uh, a lot of federal money, enormous amounts of federal money are used by the state and their metropolitan planning uh, organizations um, to expand roadways. And uh, much of it is to lock up, buy and lock up right away. So we buy it, um, we lock it up. And then that sort of basically tells the world, this is where we're gonna expand and sort of invites us, to, that's where we spend money. And then it's easy to sweep things over there. Um, but uh, the the point that appears to be made in the transportation alternatives bill and maybe in the complete streets legislation too is you really got to look at the existing right away and say how well are you using that for all modes but does the are we asking the the feds to evaluate that before um, the state is allowed to use more money to expand and purchase more right away um, that we have to say, okay, tell us how well you're using existing right away to provide uh, walking and biking facilities. Um, and this notion of retrofit is like, well, that just is an indication that it wasn't done right in the beginning. So now we have to do this right. So you already own the right away. We'd rather give you the money, um, give you grants, prioritize grants that take that existing right away 
and provide multi-modes rather than, and so it's sort of like, while we're over here talking about this, is there something over on the other side that's, that's tying, um, and you can, there'll be a huge shift if we, if the, on the national level, if the, there's limitations on what federal money can be used to purchase uh, um, new right away. Mm. Yeah, that would be a great question to bring to Karen. Um, and I don't believe that there, my impression is that um, kind of this, this grant program for retrofits is, is more to address the lack of, of funding for retrofit projects and wouldn't be um, a prerequisite to getting funding for additional new projects. I don't, I don't think they're connected in that way, um, but that, that would be an interesting question to see what, what Karen has to say. Yeah, and like, like I said, I joined the league in November, so I'm, I'm still fairly new to all of this, but um, learning as best I can. Cynthia, could I comment or? Uh, um, yeah, please do, Elaine, go ahead. Thank you. So um, I, I serve as the vice chair of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee for the National League of Cities. And we've had a lot of conversations around what is out there. And one of the pieces of that's up for discussion is what kinds of performance measures are going to be in the National Highway Performance Program. And one of the ones that's really detrimental today, I think, um, is the congestion mitigation program. And the way that they measure congestion today is, is based on hours of delay in rush hour versus uh, hour, times of day when it's not busy. And it's um, not a very good measurement actually. And so uh, at least two pieces of proposed legislation that I've seen uh, change that performance measure considerably as one effort to um, ensure that you can't use that as justification for widening the roads because that's typically the performance measure that they use. So that's one piece I do know that's, that's being, that's trying to address that. This is a great conversation, but I'd like to let Lisa talk about lobby day since we've got her here um, and we just have 20 minutes left. So. Um, let's save any more questions to the end. And Lisa, do you want to go ahead and talk about Hill Day Lobby Day? Sure. I'm super glad to talk about Hill Day Lobby Day. Uh, Lisa Brady from the Treasure Valley Safe Routes to School Program and Treasure Valley Cycling Alliance. I've had the true pleasure of going to the National Bike Summit since about 2014. That was my first exposure to lobbying in our national level offices and I was terrified. I'll just say that. And Cynthia was on that trip uh, along with our current um, Idaho Transportation Department Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator, Margaret Havey. And I think we had a couple of people from Eastern Idaho and somebody who's now a city council person in Moscow, Tom Lamar. Uh, it was fabulous and just a huge learning experience. And one of the things that I took away from that first experience that's transferred all the way to what we'll be facing next week is there are just people too. And I liked that thought uh, when we were so nervous or I was so nervous outside the office thinking, oh, you know, am I going to sound good? Is it going to go okay? Do I know my piece? Do I understand? And, and we know our piece and we know what we want and what our mutual things were. And what I love about <clears throat> lobbying with the group, especially this year's group, is we represent all kinds of different things. And I think that that's one of the important things that I learned with that first experience was each person has a story or something that they bring to it. And you never know with, uh, with the staffer or with the legislator themselves what they're going to be interested in. So I ended up learning a whole lot about McCall with our meetings from Senator Rich's office and his uh, top legislative aide who was from McCall and we had this huge connection and that translated right to meeting with Senator Rich and it it opened a different door with him and he was worried about the environment and you know whatever else that he was worried about so that was 2014 and I've gone 
uh, every year since then. I was planning on doing it last year too until COVID happened. And I have been lobbying every year since that time. And the group has shifted. Um, I've had all sorts of different people, uh, <laughs> including the year before last, which was myself and my husband. I talked him into actually going and I paid for him for one day of the summit and the lobby day just so I didn't have to go into those offices and meetings by myself. Um, being in DC is, is super fun. And, uh, you know, I would not trade that experience for anything. I think it's translated to my ability to talk to our legislators here in Idaho, our commissions, our city councils, and just people in general. So, you know, my key takeaways for lobby day are being prepared. And I never feel prepared enough, but we have enough people around us to support us. And this group this year, um, Jimmy Halliburton will be along with Cynthia and myself. We've all been lobbying before at least once, if not a million times. So we can rely on those, uh, those of us who've been there before and not have to be afraid to stand back and just watch. So a couple of other things that I think about are really key are knowing our, our issues. Like Cecily's presented to us, these are great issues that we might all know about a little bit. Um, the house bill numbers, that's important to know when you're in that office because they're going to ask that. They'll ask, is anyone else that we know supporting this issue? What other people do you have sponsoring? Do you, do you need a co-sponsor of the bill? All of those things will be coming up. Um, and I think that a few things that I just think about when I'm in there, I make a plan, whether it's me, myself, going in or we sit down like we will on this third uh what is today wednesday so thursday is when i think we have our meeting our first meeting with our idaho people we're going to set up our goals and our roles you know what is it that we want to get out of it who will be responsible for things does anybody feel reticent about being part of it you know it's not a it's not an issue for anybody who's been in there before to take more words, I guess, for lack of a better term, but I would never want to disallow somebody from speaking. And so uh, for me, having led this for a little while, I always look around to whoever I'm with to ask, is there anything that you would like to say or give you a wink or something like that to encourage you to speak out, you know? And, you know, we mostly have been meeting with staff. I'll say uh, Senator Rich, we've met with every single time. I have a lot of photos with him. Um, we've met with Senator Crapo one single time. Um, his staff is fabulous. You know, we have a relationship with them. So depending on who we're meeting with, I didn't recognize the name, but usually recognize faces if they switch out, which happens. Um, one of the things that's in the preparation materials is be prepared for changes, changes of time, changes of people. You know, we have to check on those things to make sure that we say hello to the right person. So, uh, I don't know, it's a lot of fun. I, I absolutely love doing the lobby day and so many people, and when you're in DC, it's so exciting to gather back around for the meet and greet happy hour we've invited the legislators along and we're having snacks and drinks and just you know when earl blumenauer walks in it's like hey this is so cool thank you for doing all your advocacy um it's just a true honor to actually be there and to have represented idaho for so long and then going into this one having so many more people be along for the ride so that's just a general overview i don't know if you have some specific questions or comments that you would like to have answered, but I'm glad to answer anything. Um, so anybody have any questions for Lisa? We have our first lobby day meeting tomorrow at two o'clock via Zoom. And so I want to encourage anybody who's interested in participating, if you'd like to join us, just shoot one of us an email and we'll make sure that you get included. It's just kind of a basic how to conduct a Zoom meeting and kind of get to know one another and see what people's comfort levels are and stuff. I don't think we're gonna to touch on the issues too much tomorrow. We've still got more videos to watch. 
Um, and we'd love to get some people from outside the Boise area too, if they're interested. So Sarah. I have a question for you, Lisa. So um, having not participated in one of these before, I think I get a sense of what it would be like to be there in person. I'm curious um, how the logistics are gonna work this year. You mentioned a team of three. Um, so are more people encouraged to just sort of like lurk and like be there to like, you know, speak up if needed or just even learn from the experience or is it really just kind of limited to a super small group of really awesome people? <laughs> it's not limited to that small group. And, you know, we are a small group coming from Idaho. You look at the list and California has a whole lot of people coming and they have a whole lot of meetings and they can't, they can't do what we can do. We're more nimble because we are a group of about five or six people going into these meetings. So we have different roles available, moderation, um, introductions, uh, appreciations. Uh, I'm just reading off the list that I have here, the ask, you know, putting out the bills themselves, um, asking questions, somebody's recording, um, somebody's done some research maybe. There's all kinds of roles. So if a person doesn't feel like talking, that there's a role for that. If you really feel like talking, if everybody wants to talk, then we will all share that experience because I, that is something that is so important for you to have that experience. And you may have that different connection that really just clicks it over for the legislator. And that, I think that that was one of the things I learned that first year was that conversation about McCall shifted how we talked in that room. Absolutely. And then subsequently for years after that, we could actually refer back to those things or say, hey, remember last year we talked about you're coming back to Boise and you had this experience or you've been up into Coeur d'Alene. What was that like? You know, there's a street up there that doesn't allow bikes on it. What how, what are you thinking about that? Is there any change to that? So everybody brings something different to the table and you can do what you want. It looks like Cecily, you, we can, if people just want to participate in lobby day, there's the code in the chat, lobby underscore NBS 21, right? And that'll get people $25 registration fee to participate in that one day. Exactly. Yes. And I ask you to email me if you do decide to register because we formally closed the lobby registration last week. And so when you go through the registration process, there won't be any option to select that you want to lobby. Um, and so just tell me directly and I'll make sure you get added to the list. One of the great things about attending the National Bike Summit with Lisa that one year was all the time we had to hang out and get to know other people. We ended up partying with um, Gary Fisher Gary that Fisher. one year. He <laughs> lobbies from the state of California. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's kind of a, a crazy guy, but it was really neat to meet him. He's a legend for those of you who like to ride bikes. So wow, he's yeah. very active in the advocacy world. I, I would say hoping... Sorry, go oh, ahead. Uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, we are hoping to try to recreate some of kind of that community atmosphere. So there will be um, like a little room that we keep open on lobby day that people can join and kind of say hi and share their experiences. Um, Cause that is from what I've heard, that's such a huge part of it. It's just mm -hmm. that great energy from everyone coming back from their meetings. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we'll have like a final kind of panel wrap up event. We're still deciding what it will look like exactly, but um, yeah, we wanna, we wanna celebrate. And that's what I was also going to say was last year after the the big punt and we were doing everything online, there was still that end of the summit, let's all have a drink together. I mean, I don't remember what time it was here in this time zone, but you know, we're sitting there online after the whole summit has gone by and having a drink on the screen like this. And it it felt so good it's so weird to have a happy hour like that, but knowing from what our experiences were before and all those years, that event, it was just great in connection. I have lifelong friends from the Bike Summit and lifelong advocates that I can call at any point in time and say, what's going on in your city? Can you tell me about this thing you just put in? 
it's, it's so powerful, these connections. It makes such a big difference. I really encourage you, if you haven't done the Bike Summit, this is the perfect time to go. And then next year we'll be in D.C. And I have to go to a different meeting. <laughs> so. Well, thank Thanks, you Lisa. Sharing. This is, yeah, it was really great to hear about your experience. Yeah, absolutely. So shoot me a note. Cynthia knows how to get a hold of me. I'll see you all later. I've got to go work on getting some money for our Safe Routes program. <laughs> see you. Bye, Lisa. Okay, Cecily, just before we part ways then, um, tell us again the cost because there's no plane ticket that we don't have to stay in a hotel. That, Lisa and I used to stay in a hostel and that was inexpensive, but it was only worth 50 bucks a night. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> can you go over that cost again, Cecily, so people know if they want to register for the whole summit? Mm -hmm. Yep. So the absolute cheapest one is $25 and that's to only lobby. Um, and I put the code there in the chat. And then the next cost is $100. And that includes both league membership, which costs 40, and then summit registration, which is 60. So if you're already a league member, then great, that's only $60 for you. If you want to join, it's it'll be 100 total. And then the most expensive is just general registration, not a member. And that's 180. So, you know, it makes sense to join um, if you are interested in attending. And you get other perks too, copies of Bicycling Magazine and some fun things like that. And, and you can make sure that you stay connected with the league.